undergraduate in medical school, went to undergraduate in medical school in South Dakota, uh, uh, trained at University of Wisconsin in radiation oncology, which is really one of the preeminent programs in our in our field, and stayed on staff there. And in a relatively short amount of time, really helped uh, develop an amazing academic career. Uh, was probably most well known for gynecologic brachytherapy and helped develop uh, many of the guidelines uh, and fractionation schemes that are still used today. Uh, and for personal reasons, I've moved back to South Dakota in 1999 and could have easily just uh, hung the shingle up and uh, and just practice really good medicine, but also started kind of the, I would call the second part of his academic career, um, looking at uh, uh, kind of, I guess, health disparities, especially in the Native American population. And, and that'll be a big focus of today's talk uh, along with his brachytherapy expertise. But um, we are fortunate to have him here via Zoom. We've been trying, we wanted to bring him in person, uh, but the pandemic hit, but that uh, we're hoping that this is the first of a two-part series. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Peter Wright. And thanks again for joining us today. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Chioli. And can you see my slides okay? Just want to verify. Uh, not you yet. Okay. We had this all worked out a minute ago. <laughs> Give me a second here. There we go. All right. Not quite yet. Now, okay, we see your screen. Yep. I just have to do one more yeah. thing here. Okay. And how's that? Good. That's perfect. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you for the next hour. I'd prefer to be in, in Phoenix joining you, but it's a, certainly an honor. And thank you, Dr. Kioli, for the nice remarks and introduction also to Dr. Patel. Um, as Dr. Kioli mentioned, I've had two careers, uh, one in the brachytherapy world and one in cancer disparity. So fair amount of slides, but I want to kind of give you a, a high level overview of what we've done since 2002 out here with our cancer disparity program. So I want to just launch into this. These are my disclosures. Um, we've had four R01 since 2002. We've had foundation um, support uh, for our program. I was a recent president of the American Brachytherapy Society, and I'm a consultant for Boston Scientific. So for a little geography lesson, if you don't know where Rapid City is, we're straight north of you. If thousand miles or so, not that far from Phoenix with the flight. So that's uh, uh, where I'm located. So the objectives are, I want to get into the uh, our Walking Forward Cancer Disparity Program and 20-year results, describe our ongoing lung cancer screening program, discuss another project that's ongoing, it's again funded by the NCI, and then after about 35 minutes, I want to transition into initiatives that the American Brachytherapy Society has as the recent president. Also, because we're talking to a number of radiation oncologists, I think it's good to uh, discuss some of these brachytherapy issues, and there is a connection with cancer disparities. So I look at walking forward as a timeline, where we first received our initial cycle of funding in 2002. We were part of what's called the CDRP program that I'll briefly discuss. Phase three was the next R01 with the smoking cessation project. We're currently um, finishing up phase four at the Lung Cancer Screening Project, and we're in the middle of another project um, with offering palliative care services in the tribal communities. So as Dr. Kioli indicated, I relocated here in 1999. I thought I was out of my mind lose, leaving Madison at that time, but I told him, don't worry, I have a plan. But as I was here for a year or two, it became very apparent. So a waiting room, like any other waiting room in a cancer center, but what became apparent after being here for even a few short months, and we looked at the data in our own tumor registry, is that patients with screen, American Indians with screen detectable cancers were presenting with advanced stages of cancer. And even before we put in for the grant, I took several trips to the Pine Ridge, Rosebud, and Cheyenne Reservation to really kind of figure out what in the world is going on. So geographically, Rapid City is located in western South Dakota in the Black Hills. I work for Monument Health as a radiation oncologist, and Avera Health is in Sioux Falls, but we're part of their system for walking forward, but both healthcare systems collaborate. So this is the, the geographic area where a majority of Lakota, Sioux, or Northern Plains American Indians live. Two questions I'm often asked is, one, why did you start this program? And two, how do you get programs like this up and running? So 
Um, I was privileged to be part of the presidential symposium at Astro last year and uh, told my story, so to speak. So I was asked to write up what was kind of the genesis of this. So as a bit of a history, um, my father's a retired physician, 1991. He might be listening in today. So hi, dad. Hi, mom. So my dad grew up in 19, born in 1930. He was born into poverty, saw his dad drown at the age of five. This is Frank and his mother. There were very few pictures taken back at that time. Had a rough childhood and was placed in the Nebraska Children's Home Society, where he was for probably at least five to six years. The gentleman that was head of this program is named is Randall Biart, who took care of Frank and a lot of other kids at that time. And so Frank eventually ended up becoming a, a salesman for four years, went to college at the age of 22, married my mother, went to med school, and eventually became a radiologist. But his story was certainly an inspiration for many people in my family to consider a career in medicine. This is Frank at the age of uh, in eighth grade graduation. And then about two or three weeks ago, we went back there and met the grandson of BR who wanted to meet Frank. So this is the same location. So it was really kind of a really moving trip down memory lane in Frank's history. So he truly is uh, one of the instrumental people that inspired me to go to medicine and consider uh, working in the disparity world. Within the IH system or Indian Health Service system, there are known geographic regions. I'm technically in the Northern Plains District. You folks are down in the Southwest, but there are certainly different patterns of cancer morbidity and mortality. And what we find with the Northern Plains in American Indians is that while cancer death rates have been going down for most of the population, they've actually been increasing with the American Indian population in this part of the country. And the most common cancers that we see pretty much parallel the non-Native American population. Lung cancer, as we'll get into in a moment, is the leading cause of cancer death. In fact, Northern Plains American Indians have the highest death rate in the nation. It's like over 95%. So in the field of disparities, what are disparities? Health disparities in are defined as inequities in health status, utilization or access due to structural, financial, personal, or cultural barriers. And again, unfortunately, and unfortunately, in many of the healthcare domains, the Northern Plains American Indians have some of the worst healthcare outcomes. We published a number of articles about kind of what the issue is. Uh, this came out a few years ago in advances in radiation oncology. There are known social stressors with high risk, high rates of high risk health behaviors and comorbidities. There are issues pertaining to low screening rates that pertain to funding of IHS, resources, trust, remoteness, at times health literacy. And you put all that together, and unfortunately that leads to more advanced stages of cancer. So as I showed that picture before, the waiting room, I as a radiation oncologist have no impact on someone presents to my clinic. So this is really an effort to get things, to look at things kind of further upstream and like, what are these factors that contribute to these disparities? And is there something that we could do about it? These are some tribal characteristics um, of the communities. This is a relatively young population, um, a fair amount of medical comorbidities. Unfortunately, a fair, you know, over 50% live below the poverty level. Um, there is progress in more of these uh, young folks receiving high school degrees and going on to advanced degrees. But the life expectancy in the U.S. for Pine Ridge Native Americans is only 48 for males and 52 for females. So there's something going on here. So 2001, the story really starts with an email from Dr. Manesh Mehta, who was my chair at UW-Madison. I guess a warning to the residents, be careful which email you open. This is the email that pretty much launched the program. And so this was a idea of the brainchild of Dr. Norm Coleman, Frank Govern, Vikram and Wong at the NCI and it was called the Cancer Disparity Research Partnership. And the goal was to build and stabilize independent mm -hmm. and collaborative clinical research capabilities for institutions providing radiation oncology services to those patients that experience the negative consequences of healthcare disparities. I think it's interesting that these grants were initially slated for radiation oncology community programs as opposed to primary care, which on one hand might make a little more sense. But be that as it may, Manesh Mehta and I and Dr. Judith Cowart Mayo, they were really the founding partners with us. But the idea from the NCI was all this money would go to the community cancer center, you would receive the indirects, and then you partner with academic institutions to develop a research program. So we put in for the grant in 2001. These were the initial components of walking forward behavioral research, assessing barriers, early cancer detection, 
culturally appropriate community education, comprehensive patient navigation. Back then, probably nobody knew what a patient navigator was, recruitment to clinical trials, and then we had a lot of phase two trials for common disease sites, prostate and breast cancer using brachytherapy and IMRT because a lot of these patients live an average of 150 miles from the cancer center. And so that potentially could be one of the barriers for why patients present with advanced stages of cancer. But the primary hypothesis would be, was that would these patients eventually present with earlier stages of cancer? So at that time, it was just me, myself, and I didn't have a research staff. We received a grant for 5.4 million. Came in the next day, I'm like, well, that's great. And the next day, I'm like, well, okay, how am I gonna launch this? So this is where the story begins with how do you implement these type of programs? So I'm just gonna briefly go through 20 year results and then back up a little bit um, just because of interest in time. But over, over the years, we've had a 10% um, accrual to clinical trials. We've entered 4,500 American Indians in research studies. A lot of these are um, social science studies. It's the highest uh, number in the US. Increased compliance with cancer treatment. Identification of specific barriers to effective cancer screening and cancer care. Uh, we've coordinated now 3,400 cancer screenings. We successfully completed a genetic study that I'll briefly discuss, uh, looking at the ATM gene to see if there's a reason why this population might be a little more predisposed to radiation toxicities. We completed a randomized smoking cessation trial for the radiation oncology of your residents. You're probably wondering, how did you get involved with all this? And the story will keep unfolding. Um, a big part of this, actually, the most important part is establishing trusting partnership with these communities. Like, for example, yesterday, I drove to Rosebud to, for a meeting that's a six hour round trip, and it's just, you need to be present so they know what's going on with your program creation of research infrastructure to address new research questions, continuation and creation of partnerships for sustainability. And all this led to continuation of more RONs, including the current palliative care project. Dr. Ashley Guadagnolo is a radiation oncologist at MD Anderson, and she did her research here with us, and she's been very instrumental. But this is one of the slides that she put together conceptually what we're trying to do. So in the clinic, we're seeing patients with advanced stages of disease, could we look at these predisposing factors that somehow would influence their stage of presentation? Patient navigation, this is the cornerstone of what we do. We initially had a community navigation program. We used a model within the reservations where they have uh, community health workers or um, CHRs or community health representatives. We use that model to employ American Indians who lived on the reservation that were part of the community but they were really key for assessing barriers to early cancer detection. I'm not gonna go through this data, but we administered uh, one particular survey to over a thousand participants to really identify what was going on. But their goal was to promote education, outreach and networking. And then if they came to the cancer center and had a cancer diagnosis, we had LPN and RPN navigators to help those patients navigate through the complexity of their treatment. Briefly, our staff in Pine Ridge, we have two staff there that work with us, Romaine Tobacco and Doris Thiebel. On Rosebud, where I was yesterday, Margaret O'Connor and Carolyn Spotted Tail. But this is really the reason why we've had success in our program. And then with Rapid City, David Coop and Kristen Cena, as we have probably about seven to 10,000 American Indians in Rapid City area. So we you know, need to work, obviously we wanna work with that population. And then Michelle Sargent is really my right-hand person who helps uh, things on a day-to-day -day basis in addition to Jessica and Mary Stein. But without showing the data, do we have an impact with patient navigation? We did surveys, we did assessments of patients going through treatment, especially for head and neck cancer and cervical cancer. We demonstrated incre increased compliance with the robust navigation program. We were able to demonstrate there was overall experience was enhanced looking at press Ganey surveys was there a change in trust towards the healthcare system? That's a hard one to tackle, uh, but it was felt that what we were doing was culturally competent. So this is the road down to Pine Ridge. This isn't like getting on the interstate. And as you probably know, for the Mayo folks in Rochester, a lot of folks from Rapid City like to go to Mayo. They get on I-90 and you're there in a few hours. The roads down to the tribal communities aren't quite as robust. So one of the ways that we've commuted our program um, is through a, a uh, a radio station called Keeley Radio. You might want to Google on this. This is located north of the um, Wounded Knee Nas Massacre. It's in the Pine Ridge area. But this gentleman here, Tom Casey, he's been interviewing us for years since 2002. And he's been 
really instrumental for us to get the word out to the community when we're trying to recruit for a number of uh, community events. Pine Ridge Hospital, again, this takes a presence to go down to the three IHS hospitals so they know exactly what you're doing. In fact, anytime you do a program, especially in Pine Ridge, you're required to go down to present to their IRB so they know exactly what you're doing. And it does require you know, a lot of infrastructure to get this up and running so you can gain the trust of the community. We're trying to avoid what's called helicopter research, meaning you go in, you extract the data, you leave, and you don't give anything back to the community. So for a while, we had a lot of, uh, we were actually able to provide financial assistance. We didn't want to replace what was available through the Indian Health Service, but we were, help, we were able to help some of the issues with transportation, lodging, and food. So a lot of times it's as basic as that. Clinical trial rationale. Um, emerging technologies often are only available in early implementation are best administered through clinical trials. Nationally, minority participation rate has been very low, and could that potentially be uh, one of the reasons that these patients present with more advanced stages of cancer. As we'll get into a bit, I'm a big brachytherapist. We see women with very advanced stages of cancer where with um, hybrid or image-guided brachytherapy, the cure rates are better. We do a lot of prostate brachytherapy, HDR and LDR. And back in 1999 when I moved here, um, I wasn't doing breast brachytherapy that time, but I kept my staff privileges at UW-Madison and went back and forth to learn interstitial brachytherapy. We also did clinical trials with HDR, prostate brachytherapy, and we'll go back to this in a moment. But in the world of breast cancer, in the 90s, there was a report that came out that the mastectomy rates for women in this part of the country were over 90%. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But when we look at our own data and compare it to the SEER data, so this is looking at, was there a change in breast preservation rates over time due to the implementation of navigation in the hospital here after the navigation program was started, um, hired a breast navigator. But between a breast navigator and the breast brachytherapy program, did we, see, did we see a change in breast conservation rates? And, and the answer is yes. Now, this is retrospective, but one of the barriers that women experienced to not undergoing at that time six weeks of whole breast radiation is they just live too far away. So as part of this phase two trial, um, with the help of University of Wisconsin, initially a lot of these people were treated with interstitial breast brachytherapy until we used the single entry catheter devices. We were able to demonstrate that there's been an improvement in breast preservation rates. Obviously, you're not a candidate for this unless you have stage one disease, and that links to our navigation program where we worked with what's called the BSEP program to help promote um, early breast cancer screening and detection. So if those women were diagnosed with stage breast cancer, especially if they were from you know, the tribal communities, we could shorten their treatment from six weeks to one week. Interesting publication that came out in JCO looking at breast brachytherapy utilization. Turns out that Western South Dakota was a high-end user, but this was really driven by the grant because this particular trial addressed a need for the patient population, a shorter course of treatment. And those patients, there's about 70 to 80 that went on the trial. And as you'd anticipate, the local control rates were high and any significant adverse effects were low. This particular gentleman here, this again emphasizes the value of prostate LDR brachytherapy. This gentleman, his picture is used with permission, he lives in this part of Cheyenne River, has no transportation. There is a cancer center in Pierre where they could have done external beam, but the only option for him was LDR prostate brachytherapy. Now that wasn't exactly done in a clinical trial because that's a standard of care, but again, another example of how this met the needs of the community. Tomotherapy. Back in the day, this comes from my relationships with the University of Wisconsin. We were the fourth site to have this form of IMRT. And as the Radonc folks know, this was a game changer back in the day. Um, we implemented this back in 2001 with a little bit of hiccups. This is a medicine man that came to bless the machine. But we enrolled, this is our most rapidly occurring trial uh, for patients with low to intermediate risk prostate cancer. We were able to shorten the number of fractions from initially 38 to 22 to 16 to 12, but it met, again, a need for the community. As you would anticipate, the biochemical control rates were very high. The rates of rectal bleeding were about 7%, 7 um, grade 2 rectal bleeding. Now, if anyone's undergoing hypofractionation, we put in the hydrogel spacer device. One of the things that we observed in the population is that they seem to have a little higher rates of acute radiation toxicities. So another study that we implemented was looking at the ATM gene with Amy Moser in University of Wisconsin, where she, she sequenced the gene 
for 100 natives, 100 non-natives. The holy grail for radiation oncology would be is if you could find a molecular marker to find out who's predisposed to a higher radiation complication, especially for example, prostate cancer, well then that patient may want to explore a surgical approach. This study was really underpowered to show any significant differences in the SNPs, but the success of the study was we were actually able to do this because we were initially told you wouldn't be able to conduct a genetic study in a, in a disparate population. When the NCI would get a hold of us every quarter or so, Frank Govern is my mentor and colleague, he always wants to know how many manuscripts have you published and how many people have you put on clinical trials. That's obviously important, but that's really the top of the pyramid. This starts with establishing trust within the populations. A lot of these patients were not a candidate for clinical trial because they, were, they had very advanced stages of disease or they had significant medical comorbidities. So these components here have helped increase accrual rates of various clinical trials, whether it's through the cooperative group mechanism or our own phase two trials. So in phase two of walking forward, we continued with the same program. We received a similar amount of funding. We continue to partnerships, especially with University of Wisconsin and the Mayo Clinic. But the one thing that we implemented in, in phase two is we put a cancer screening coordinator within each Indian Health Service uh, unit. So as you can imagine, we have our community navigation program promoting screening. We had a clinical trial where we could follow them until the time they had a, a normal or abnormal test. And then we'd rapidly get them referred for further evaluation because one of the issues can be delay in cancer diagnosis and initiation of treatment. An example of one of our screening, our educational events, this is up in Cheyenne River. I like this picture, this was taken down in Rosebud last year. These communities are hard to get into. This particular location has no internet service. I was down in Rosebud yesterday. That's an issue for a lot of these rural populations. And so recruitment to a lot of our social science studies at times has been on, our staff have been terrific in recruiting, but they know the population, times they knock on doors, and we did one of our education events here. Some of our screening initiatives, as of October of this year, we've coordinated about 3,400 3, screenings, that now includes lung cancer. We looked at this data now over 10 years ago, and there's a suggestion that in the pre-walking forward versus the walking forward era that we're seeing natives with earlier stages of cancer. And I do tend to use the term American Indians, Native Americans, and Natives interchangeably. So there was at least a suggestion that maybe there's been some positive impact. Well, in 2012, CDRP was phased out, which is a euphemism for you guys are responsible for finding your own funding. So we put in for the third phase of walking forward, which is a smoking cessation study we partner with a lot of tremendous uh, scientists around the U.S. Linda Burhan Stepanoff has been one of our key partners. We put in for this R01, um, which was a smoking cessation project with a number of best investigators from UW Madison and elsewhere. And so the primary hypothesis is why don't more Northern Plains American Indians alter tobacco use behaviors known to increase the risk of cancer? In other words, why are they continuing to smoke knowing that it's bad for them? So we developed this intervention. It was a randomized controlled trial for 250, 256 participants, all American Indians, looking at interventions of nicotine replacement, pre-cessation counseling, post-cessation counseling, and mHealth, culturally appropriate text messaging. And this uh, phase three trial was published two years ago in contemporary clinical trials. What we did find is that the smoke, smoking cessation rate was about 25% at six months. That's a, much better than if someone goes cold turkey or if they just do Shantex at one year it was 21%. And we found that all four of these interventions had an impact as far as smoking cessation. And you can see on this graph, the longer that you're in the study, the more likely that you'll be um, smoke free. So that project was ongoing. I asked my staff in 2016, I said, well, where do you wanna go next? Because it's always an evolving door so to speak of, you know, what's the next project gonna be? And so we decided that we really needed to enter the space of lung cancer screen. Uh, the rationale is pretty obvious. And for, unfortunately, in a lot of the travel communities, the smoking rates are as high as 20 to 40%. This population has a very high cancer death rate from lung cancer. In fact, it's the highest in the US. And this is data from our own uh, tumor registry, again, looking at native versus non-native that these patients are presenting with stage three and stage four disease. That, you know, one of the main goals is, or motivations for me as a treating oncologist is rather than seeing people that have 
bone, brain, and liver metastasis, gosh, can't we get them screened earlier? So for the rationale, historically in this part of the country, it's been a low rate of screening. We've estimated in our part of the state, 14,000 patients are at risk. There has been limited utilization of low-dose CT scans. Many high-risk individuals have been unaware. And then there are also the question you have to ask, well, if you're going to screen for a cancer, do you have any good treatment options? And the answer is yes. Um, obviously, limited surgery or stereotactic radiation with all the technology that we have can achieve very high rates of local control. So this grant was put in for an R01. It wasn't funded. Fortunately, the Bristol Myers Scrib Foundation picked it up and funded the question or funded the grant, but the research question was, will provider and or individual level interventions increase rates of LDC utilization amongst high-risk smokers in Western South Dakota? How are we going to accomplish this? So aim one is screening awareness, building on our previous research with the networking that we have in the community to improve provider and individual awareness of the value of LDC uh, screening. This was done through initial and follow-up surveys. I'll get into the interventions in a moment. And then we have a policy symposium that's actually going to be conducted in about one month. So this was a two by two study design targeting primary care providers and individuals. Uh, both interventions included education and introduction to an online resource that we developed. And the primary metric was to increase LDCT utilization. Now I've been out here since 1999. So I know most of the characters that live in this part of the state as far as radiologists, primary care physicians. And so these are the LDCT sites within South Dakota. The majority of them are in the Black Hills, but currently there's none in the tribal communities. But we do use these sites. I believe this is located in Phillips, South Dakota, in Pierre. So I'm happy to report that we've actually completed the study um, with our provider workshop and CME sessions. We've conducted 135 out of our accrual. With our community intervention, uh, we've um, had 1,000 participants. And to date, there's been 238 LDCT referrals with 189 completed. This is the trajectory of LDCT utilization. So we have agreements with each imaging center uh, to find out what their rates of LDCT utilization are every six months. And as you can see over time, we had a nice increase. COVID hit, everything shut down, and then we rebounded again in the last um, year and a half. Overcoming challenges. Indian Health Service is currently not covering the cost nor providing LDCTs. Rosebud is going to start offering these in the near future. and We're trying to partner with them with our radiologists to get them up and running. IHS is underfunded. And so one of the, and so they often talk about a life and limb policy in, in the past screening hasn't been as much of a priority, but it has become more of a priority recently. When I presented our project to um, the Pine Ridge uh, IRB, they said, well, that's great, Dr. Peter, you're going to come down here and promote lung cancer screening, but we don't provide that service. I said, I know, but we're working on it. So fortunately, we had a foundation that donated $152,000 to screen patients that don't have resources for screening, mainly the American Indian population, so we're able to fill that void. And again, this is part of a clinical trial or a study to follow these patients until they're screened. They recently um, extended our project for another uh, year by donating additional amount of money. So we've been grateful to have um, a lot of this foundational support. Overcoming challenges during COVID, um, as you can see, the masks, outdoor uh, educational events, especially a lot of one-on-one -on -one interventions. This particular photograph here kind of summarizes you know, what, our, what our staff is capable of. So this is a six-month survey that's being administered on the hood of a pickup truck after a blizzard north of the Wounded Knee Massacre, where this couple had to walk a mile down the road to meet our staff. So they know how to get into these communities. They know how to get the job done. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've had this ongoing working relationship and trusting partnership within the communities. The last part of this grant is a policy, policy symposium that's being performed in partnership with Betty Jacobs of Georgetown University. But this symposium, you're all invited. It's November 3rd and 4th. Um, these are some of our speakers, including Dr. Tilbert, who's coming up here from the Mayo Clinic in your location. But one of the goals is to educate the community, primary care providers. We have data that we're going to share. Uh, there may actually be a change in the, um, we know from the U.S. Preventative Task Force what the recommendations are for screening the general population. We're working on an analysis where those recommendations are probably going to be different for the American Indian population. So, for example, if you started smoking when you're 15 and you're 35, 
eh, you're probably eligible for an LDCT. We can cover the cost for that right now so we don't have to adhere to strict CMS criteria. So the last phase or the current phase is our palliative care project. And so as a treating oncologist, I see this every day in the clinic, but palliative care is one of the greatest needs for the Northern Plains American Indians. Palliative care in the past has almost been non-existent. The root causes are distance to the cancer center, lack of transportation, lack of community-based palliative care. Unfortunately, a lot of these patients die at home with inadequate palliation and early application of palliative care has been shown to demonstrate improved outcomes for several cancers. So since we're on the reservation a lot, we network with people. One of the folks that we've been working with is Dr. Katrina Armstrong, who her and her group at MGH in Boston provide primary care. So she really took the lead with her team and with Walking Forward Avera, in addition to other institutions within the state, to put in for this R01 to advance palliative care in this population. So the overarching project goal is to develop and test a multi-pronged strategy for the delivery of palliative care all phases of this are being guided by a community advisory board composed of tribal health leaders and representative members from the first three from the three tribes. And we're actually done with phase one. So phase two is probably going to look like a patient navigation model within the community. So a lot of those details are being worked out, but that project has been ongoing. Dr. Tilbert, I want to recognize John again. We've been working with John for a long time with prostate decision aids. We're currently working on focus groups where we want to implement a Northern Plains American Indian Health Initiative. That's a group that's been kind of lacking as far as a group that's been studied. And so we have focus groups going on. Dr. Tilbert's been terrific with helping us with this initiative. And our goal is to put in for hopefully phase six of walking forward uh, by targeting American Indian Men's Health Initiative. And some of this may happen in your own community as well. Pathways to Sustainability. This is community-based participatory research. Patient navigation is the foundation of what we do. There's constant communication with our staff and community. Our staff, since they live in the community, we, we know very well what's going on. We adapt to community signals, you know, maybe walking forward to do things a little bit different way. Um, but that community presence has really allowed us to establish this ongoing trust. And I would say at a national level that other programs often approach us and ask, how can we work with walking forward to implement some potentially useful research strategies. This is called implementation science. It took 18 months to get this off the ground with numerous IRB approvals and tribal letters of support. It takes absolute persistence. I would say for all of our staff, the motivation is to help the underserved. And the end result is out of the six initial CDRP programs through, I would say the grace of God, good luck and terrific staff. We've gone from a five-year program to a 22-year program with 16 million in funding and over 65 manuscripts published. But at the end of the day, hopefully are we making a, a difference? Some of the patient lessons learned, this takes time. It's essential that the principal investigator is part of the community. That's why I try to get down there frequently, which I couldn't do during COVID. I do have one day a, a week of dedicated research time with funding. And then, and then within Indian Health Service, we met with them yesterday. It's a policy issue. We're gonna work on this policy issue for LDCTs. How can we increase funding for IHS? This is one of my good friends. I took care of his wife, Larry. These are all used with permission. Uh, I like to use Larry as my sounding board. You can imagine Larry looking at me and saying, I don't think that's a good idea, Doc. You should probably try that a different way. So Larry and a lot of other people have been really instrumental. Our vision is to improve the quality of life for American Indian cancer patients from early detection, successful treatments and survivorship, including in the life care, and our mission is that this has been and will continue to be accomplished through access to screening, state-of-the-art treatments and clinical trials, and comprehensive patient navigation. And our current LDCT project expands into the entire population, not only the American Indians, but the high-risk smokers. I do want to bring this publication to your attention for the residents, but I think this was an important publication, not because I was a co-author, but because the, the message from this article was, what else can we do as, in radiation oncology? I often argue you need to get out of the basement. You need to find out what's going on in your communities. And so there are lots of career paths for radiation oncologists besides just doing radiation. I wanna thank some of my key mentors for walking forward. Um, Norm Coleman, Linda Burhan Stefanoff, Dr. Guadagnolo. This is my team in Rapid City, uh, Pine Ridge and Cheyenne and uh, Rosebud. That's cheers for my wife and I, and I'm gonna kind of transition to the next talk here. And I wanna leave time for questions. 
Hopefully you can still hear me okay. Yes, it's been great. No problems. All right. I know I'm, I'm covering a lot, so just hang in there. All right. So these slides, can you see these okay? I'm just, um, are you able to see these yeah, slides? Yeah, I can see them. Okay. All right. Yes, so, sir. Part of my disclosure, I was the president of the American Brachytherapy Society for a year, three years ago, and they asked me to do this. I, I asked them, well, you know where I live, don't you? I live in Rapid City. My predecessors are from Harvard, MD Anderson, you know, the big academic institutions. And I said, well, let me talk to my wife where I take this on because I, you know, all this stuff takes time. But I said, if I'm going to do this, we want to potentially do something meaningful. So I want to go into some brachytherapy initiatives and why I think this is important. So. This came about six years ago. We published in JCO, brachytherapy, or is it gone, especially for prostate brachytherapy. Dr. Paul Harari wrote this in the Astra editorial 2000, or two years ago, but it really succinctly defined the problem, and that is declining use of brachytherapy, the reason multifactorial, but substituting IMRT or SBRT is a major contributor, the pipeline in serious jeopardy as a majority of residents identify low procedural volume is a barrier to achieving brachytherapy independence. And the result is definitely diminished cure rates for cervical cancer, limited options for pro patients with prostate cancer, and arguably potentially lower cure rates when you look at the ascend RT trial. So what are our solutions? Well, number one is this has to start in radiation oncology programs. The most dramatic decline was in academic centers. I'm not showing this data, but it's been well published. So my plea to program chairs is higher competent brachytherapists and obviously the Mayo Clinic at all three um, locations have premier radiation oncology programs including brachytherapy. ABS initiatives will be a challenge if residents don't have the training. So we do have a lot of measures in place to try to help with this. One of this is we'll get into 310 in a little bit but I don't know if you remember back in the early 1980s Andy Grover went to the Seattle Prostate Institute had a prostate brachytherapy implant and that totally launched the Seattle Prostate Institute, and they trained the majority of prostate brachytherapists in the 90s. We have to have a public awareness campaign. ABS is working on that for prostate, GYN, and breast cancer. Increased public awareness, you're increasing the demand. And this isn't meant to be a selfish statement, but if patients aren't aware of this option, especially for prostate cancer, they won't have access. So. I and others, this is really a continuation of what we've done in ABS for decades with our schools and our uh, training curriculum. But 310 means the goal is to train 30 competent brachytherapy teams per year over the next year, for the next 10 years through a six phase program. And it's evolved into a five year strategy. So, how are we doing this? One is, to, and a lot of this is already underway, one is to develop a national brachytherapy curriculum to a simulation-based medical education, and there's a lot of radiation oncologists that work in this space. This is one thing I'll talk about in detail, all the two-month fellowships at designated ABS certified centers. We're looking at a competency evaluation, some type of certification, as well as maintenance of certification. Parallel to this program, uh, Dr. Franco and Singer at Harvard, um, at least is now at UCSF, they've implemented a pilot program called Next Gen Brachytherapy, and the goal of next-gen brachytherapy is to pair senior brachytherapists with junior brachytherapists. It's an opportunity for them to discuss cases. Um, it provides op opportunities for career growth and networking, and at least it's published on some of this information. There are also virtual training opportunities, as evident by what we've done to Zoom here. Neil Tonk has developed uh, these Google Glasses. We'll talk about that in a moment. If you go to the ABS website, you can actually access these training videos for free. Um, we do podcasts, webinars, Next Gen Breaky Therapy. But I do want to announce this just went live, so pay, no, pay attention to this one. We have a partnership with Grand Rounds in Urology, which is a series of 40 Breaky Therapy lectures. Before I get into that, these are the Google Glasses. These are pretty phenomenal technology where you actually take these glasses, you put it on your phone and you can walk around the OR to see what individuals are doing. Back to the what we have now with Grand Rounds in Urology. This is an initiative that we started with ABS leaders, but if you go to the ABS website, these are free, you have to register, but there's a total of three sessions. The first session has 13 talks, and they're about, about 10 to 15 minutes, 
but it's really geared to get the word out about the value of radiation for prostate cancer, especially for prostate brachytherapy. This is one of my favorite talks from Stephen Franks, and it talks about the myths and facts of prostate brachytherapy. So you should definitely go, go on that and access those. If you have any problems, let me know. Myra Keyes, who's really leading this initiative, she's a lovely Canadian who is just a superb individual. She gives two phenomenal talks, but those are 10 to 15 minute talks that are not only geared to, I would say, gently nudge the urologist that their patient should have access to a discussion with the radiation oncology about options, but also for the general population. So again, that's grand rounds in urology, and that was just launched within the last week or two. To me, the most important part of 310 are the AVS two-month electives. And I so what this looks like is it's PGY4 and PGY5 residents that come from institutions that may not have high enough procedural volume where they can go to these institutions for two months to either do GYN or prostate, LDR or HDR. This has been delayed for a year and a half because of COVID. We now have applications on the ABS website. Right now, we have applications open uh, to learn HDR prostate brachytherapy at Dr. Hong Zhang at the University of Rochester. Um, I'll just throw it out to, to the Mayo group, and I reached out to Brian Davis and Brad Stish um, if they're potentially willing to take a resident. We don't want this competing with your own residents, but if we're looking for either high volume community practices or academic practices that would have the bandwidth to take a two month uh, resident. The reason we're doing, we're targeting PGY four and five is that once they've graduated, there's really difficult issues with credentialing. And right now you probably already take residents from other institutions. And so that program, I hope to get up and running as I'm currently past chair of the board. Uh, Dr. Joyti Mahideev at UCSF, um, and, and actually USCD and, and, and University of California in San Diego. Um, I put in for an AMA grant to fund this. I put in for an RO, ROI through the Radiation Oncology Institute. They weren't funded, but she called me and said, can we take the grants that you've submitted and put in for an RO1? And I said, absolutely. So she and her team have put in for an RO1, and the title is Increasing Access to Quality Brachytherapy and Cervical Cancer. Um, that basically parallels the 310 initiative. There are seven named centers of excellence. If this grant is funded, it'll be the first NIH grant for 310. Um, a lot of this was based on previous work that we did for the AMA and RO, ROI grants we put in. But we encourage other PIs to write similar grants for prostate brachytherapy training. And it's also an opportunity for our industry partners to consider funding portions of this. I'll shamelessly put a plug into your residence why you should join ABS. Uh, there's no cost. You'll get a pair of VR goggles for free. There's access to the Journal of Brachytherapy online. We're a smaller society, great opportunity for networking and getting involved. It's a way to maintain and expand your brachytherapy skills. And who knows, you too could be the next president because that wasn't one of my goals when I signed up for this years ago. Just want to reflect for a minute or two on my experience as a brachytherapist. I trained uh, back in the days of GYN at UW-Madison, uh, Dr. Acchioli had indicated, but I've kept up my relationships with UW-Madison, other programs that we've been able to successfully implement about all the brachytherapy programs that exist. Uh, we recently went back to doing HDR trust as a boost for prostate cancer, and I believe you folks are doing that. We quit doing that 15 years ago because at that time it required an inpatient hospitalization for fractions, and to be honest, it was just too much work. So it went back to an LDR boost. But for those patients with intermediate to high and high risk prostate cancer, we've gone back to doing a single fraction of 15 gray um, in one setting. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Davis and Dr. Stish for helping us as well as many other people. So for the residents, when you get done with your training, you're going to continue lifelong learning. But this is all achievable through networking, keeping in contact with your home institution. Plus, it's just a lot of fun to keep these programs up and running. Um, my crazy idea as president was, let's do a meeting at Big Sky, Montana. So um, they acquiesced and said, okay, we'll do it. This was the last meeting we had in person for ABS. This was in, I believe, February 2020. But it's a great society, and I'm going to end right there. And I think we have a good 15 minutes to take some questions. And thank you for inviting me and for listening in. Hey, thank you so much. That was, uh, it was a whirlwind, but it was presented in a way that I think it was really easy to follow. And um, boy, I picked up a lot that I <clears throat> want to follow up on. Let's see, we got a few questions. Um, uh, 
Dr. Patel's on the road, um, but was attending the uh, was attending the talk, but probably not in a good position to uh, to speak. But he had a question, Dr. Peter Wright. So thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I apologize for not being there personally. Since we see Native Americans from many different tribes, any common pearls for our oncology providers that could help put patients at ease when seeing them in consultation? So, sorry, I just got interrupted for a second, but it's uh, asked the last part of the question. As far uh, as any common pearls for our oncology providers that could help put our patients at ease when seeing uh, uh, Native Americans in consultation? You know, I mean, it's a it's a great question, and um, you know, our own staff did a lot of cultural sensitivity training. Um, I mean, I think like other patients that we work with, it's really getting to know them. You know, in your, you know, in the Southwest, I see Dr. Tobert's on the call, so thank, thanks, John, for joining. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a combination of getting to know the patients, potentially visiting these communities to finding out some of their needs are. You know, it was helpful for us that we had dedicated uh, navigators who are American Indians. I think, listen, I mean, it's, it's a great question with no simple answer, but I think a lot of it is listening and learning what their issues are locally. Um, and the longer you do this, I mean, I probably learned, I mean, I've learned more about American Indian culture in the last 22 years than I did my entire lifetime. But a lot of that learning has come from my patients and going down to the communities and just asking them, you know, what are things that, you know, how was your healthcare experience? You know, what are things that we can do better for, you know, and this isn't to be critical of Indian Health Service because they're underfunded, but what are some potential ways that you think we could address some of the things that you experience at home? I think patient navigation is potentially a, um, an answer and I would imagine you have navigators down there. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Patel had a question, uh, had a comment and, and it's something I noticed as well. Um, one of the most impactful pictures that you showed, I think there were many, was the picture of the medicine man blessing the tomotherapy machine. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Where was that? Like what city? Because I know you, you cover four or five cities. And um, what was the, you, that obviously hopefully will uh, increase uh, the comfort level of the Native American population, but can you talk about that and how you incorporate um, the Native American, I guess, uh, cultures and sensitivities into how you deliver care? That's one of my favorite pictures. So he's a medicine man that we've worked with in the past, and one of our staff asked if he would be willing to come up and do a, a smudging ceremony and a blessing in the tomotherapy machine. And, you know, with the circle that's often in a lot of American Indian art and literature, um, it may sound a little bit goofy, but because that's a helical treatment and they talk about the circle of life and things like that, it would, it would just kind of fit. And he, so we brought in some patients, we brought him in, he did a smudging, he did a prayer and it was, it was very meaningful. Neat. And, um, staff who works, he, he was from Pine Ridge and was agreeable to, uh, and, and wanted to come up and give a talk. And we have another traditional healer coming up for our lung cancer screening symposium. We'll do opening prayers and, uh, bless the ceremony. So, you know, again, try under that umbrella of, of wanting to be culturally sensitive and that this isn't the white person coming in from Rapid City, you know, trying to implement yeah. what we think good idea. But uh, that was done yeah. in Rapid City. And you're right, it is a whirlwind tour, but I often do these, I'll, we'll do two talks, one hour talk on this, another hour of brachytherapy. So I'm trying to give you two for one, so to speak. So <laughs> I think a question from, uh, Question from Trudy Jackson: uh, As native, uh, similar to the last uh, two, as native as native patients may be hesitant for Western medicine versus traditional medicine. How do you encourage Western medicine treatment while respecting their wishes on traditional medicine? Patients may prefer to smudge first prior to treatment. Yeah, no, we we endorse. I, mean, I have that conversation routinely. You know, especially when you have someone with an incurable cancer. <laughs> unresectable mm -hmm. pancreatic cancer, metastatic lung, GBMs. Uh, so what else is important to you as far as your healing process? And if they say, well, you know, we, I work with the traditional healers and I said, well, we highly encourage that. And I think that's an important part of your healing. And, and we've had medicine men specifically tell patients you need to go up to the cancer center and get treated. They're not mutually exclusive. They can be beneficial. And I'm not aware there's ever been any toxicity overlap. And so I, I, I think they work in synergy. 
and we encourage it. So if someone were to say, well, that's silly and you should just be doing what we're doing, that would be very offensive to that individual patient. Plus, I think you know, a lot of what we do is paleation and, and the part of our palliative care sure. project reached out to traditional healers and they're part of our, our community advisory board and how do we partner with them, especially for incurable cancers. I found it uh, interesting that you had, uh, uh, I'm going to probably butcher her last name, but Dr. Guad Agnello. Yeah, Guad okay. Ashley Guadagnolo. Yeah. Um, uh, do a extended, uh, I guess, fellowship or mini fellowship with you. Um, can you describe that? How did that work? Uh, was that uh, mid career for her? Was that after training? And how long did she stay? And clearly, you did some meaningful work together. Yeah, no, I feel like, use a biblical term, a man of falling from the sky. I had Ashley Guadagnolo come through, and Sunshine Gojak come through. So these are, uh, both these folks, Ashley was doing her, her MPH at Harvard, and then mm -hmm. someone that she knew at UW-Madison, and, and Ashley is American Indian. Uh, she's from Oklahoma. She came out here and said, gee, I'd like to you know do some work with your group. I didn't show all of her data, but she's had, so she technically came as part of her MPH program at Harvard. Anthony D'Amico blessed it. She really helped with the survey development. I mean, I don't have my MPH. I feel like I have one through the School of Hard Knocks, but she, she was great and she's continued to work with us. And, but it uh, probably one of the highlights of my academic career is being able to work with people like Ashley. And so she did a lot of initial work. She's continued to do some work for us. And, and then she's done, you know, she continues some of that um, dispar disparity work at MD Anderson. And then we had a head and neck surgeon, uh, Sunshine Dojak, come in kind of on the same track. And what we tell them is, here's our program. Here's our staff. Let us know what you're interested in doing. You know, we'll have you write up what the research question is. We'll go on your behalf to the tribal councils and ask if they think that's an appropriate question, if they want to participate. Fascinating. How long did they spend on site with you? Ashley would probably come out for two to four weeks at a time. Okay. She did a lot of it remotely, but I bet she spent at least four weeks or more intermittently because she wanted um, to come back to the community and participate and find out what was going on. Okay. Um, Dr. Sitharam, uh, one of our medical oncologists who focuses on sarcoma and melanoma. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, from my understanding, undertake, uh, undertaking research initiatives in the Native American community is not an easy task. Any pearls as to uh, what, in your experience, makes it easier to collaborate and who should be at the table? So speaking from my own experience, when we received the grant in 2002, at that time, Judith Cower, who I'm sure you all know, a medical oncologist who's now retired in Florida, I don't know if Judith is on, you know, I sat down and she helped design the project. She's the one that put us in touch with Linda Burhan Stipanoff, who's a PhD social scientist researcher. So we quickly assembled this team is, you know, I'm a radiation oncologist. I mean, technically, yeah. I probably should be internal medicine with an MPH, but I'm not, so it is what it is. But it was really important to identify, you know, even before we put in the grant, we went down to the community and asked, you know, what do you think are some of the issues? So it was a lot of road time to find out from the population, both from individual patients, community members, meeting with tribal health board, because you don't, the last thing you want to do is you receive a grant and they don't know about it. And we're like, well, you didn't ask us permission. So, and that's going to be, that's going to vary from community to community. So I would say my own perspective is listening to the patients going down, you know, it's, it's Pine Ridge is about an hour and a half from here. The other is about two to three hours away, you know, gaining that trust where they would want to work with you. And, you know, I guess for lack of a better way of saying it, one of the advantages that I have, I'm already part of the community. I mean, they're coming here for their cancer treatment. So it's, you know, so we're, we're a known entity and hopefully they've had a, hopefully a positive experience. They wouldn't think negatively about us coming down to try to look at research questions that may help with addressing some of these, you know, major disparities. I mean, the overarching issue is, just, is poverty. And that's another topic. How do you tackle that one? And cancer is, is one of many symptoms of why do they continue to smoke? Well, if your life expectancy is 50 and, and the smoking can be an antidepressant, are you really worried about living to be 70 or 80? Maybe not, but there are some beacons of hope. You know, one, there's another topic, but there's a group, if you want to Google on um, Thunder Valley, that's a, a new organization that's down in Pine Ridge, but it's a platform for economic development to help kids get trained to do skillful labor, to build their own homes, 
Um, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of hope that's going on. You have people like Dr. Don Warren, who's an American Indian physician who's up at North Dakota. Um, we have, uh, there's a program called InMed, Indians in Medicine. We're seeing more American Indian um, medical students. So I, I do think overall the trajectory is, is more positive. Um, the, uh, I thought it was interesting, the proof of principle um, that uh, on the ATM study, um, while that, as you pointed out, was negative perhaps because it was underpowered, it did show that you could do a genetic study in this population. Um, have there been follow-ups to that? And uh, where do you see the future of that? And do you see widespread uh, uh, next generation sequencing uh, coming into the community? I mean, I think in the medical oncology world, yes, because that's going to be a standard of care. The interesting thing about that study is we had 200 DNA samples in a freezer at UW-Madison where we had a wealth of information that we could have come back and sequenced more genes, but that would have been, that would have violated what we said we were going to do. So we right. told them once the study is done, we're going to destroy all the DNA samples, which was the right thing okay. to do. So sure, we did. Absolutely. Um, well. Yeah, as you said, it's about trust. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's trust. It, but no, I, I, I mean, I, to the residents, if anyone's listening on, I mean, or, or the molecular biologist, we need to find a, you know, a radiation sensitivity gene or marker. You know, people have looked at ATM, but it, I still don't think the verdict's out on that. But it was, it was an interesting study to do because at that time it was a basic science question. Obviously, I'm not sequencing deep DNA in Rapid City, but with the collaborations with UW Madison, I mean, they were very happy to do it. Oh, I think, uh, I feel like, well, funny, I took down a ton of notes. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to continue this, this dialogue with you offline. Yeah, yeah, because we won't, but um, I do have that. Well, there's a couple more I wanted to ask you. Um, uh, your relationship with the Irving Hansen Foundation, I think they, you wrote, they gave you 150, or you said they gave 152,000 to get the low dose CT program going and they've continued that. And uh, you showed a graph, obviously the LDCTs have gone up significantly. There's a small blip for COVID, but that washed right. away over time. Um, what, uh, like, how does that work? Do you partner with uh, local radiology practices and say, okay, um, and and do they get compensated or like so how does that and then obviously you've got to build the trust but then you've actually also got to get the uh, ct and then i know there's mobile cts do you actually take mobile cts into the community or do you get them uh to a well, ct center we thought about mobile cts but it was just too heavy of a lift and so there's really just one group of radiologists in western south dakota and so the agreement we have with them is it's 200 and either 25 or 50 for everything, professional okay. and technical. Oh, great. And so we have that money. We have a little bit of a stipend that we can provide for transportation to get them up here. Um, but for a lot of those folks, they have to come to the Black Hills to get it done. And so even within, we have Epic, as I know you do, there's even an Epic walking forward button. So I just click on walking forward. They call my staff. I mean, here's an interesting story. We There were, there were some, I mean, I, primary care docs are busy and we get it, but we yeah. set this whole program up in Pine Ridge where literally all they have to do is sign an order. That's it. And we'll take it from there. So if you have a 30 pack year smoking history and you're 45 years old, we'll cover it because we have the money to do it. Plus that makes sense. And we're looking at this data to see if our, the eligibility criteria should be different. So this is how, this is another interesting story. So there's a thing called the Lakota national invitational. It's a big basketball tournament in Rapid city. They have thousands of American Indian, Indians came in, I signed a hundred blank forms for LDCTs because I wasn't getting traction down in Pine Ridge at that time. I said, if you see people, if you think they're eligible, just sign them up. We'll take care of it. Now, that's a little bit of a drastic measure that kind of circumvents the whole education process. But if they're not getting screened and they're coming in with bone and brain and liver mets and we have money to fund this, let's just get it going. Fascinating. Well, I, this, I mean, I could go on for an hour, but I better let you go. I'm sure you have a busy clinic. and uh, But, uh, boy, I'd love to continue the dialogue with you offline. And we really need to get you on campus uh, when you. the circumstances permit. And hopefully that could be early. Um, hopefully that could be early 2022. Yeah. I just want to say hi to John. John, are you on? Do you want to say anything about the Men's Health Initiative? 
because John's been terrific helping us over the years. There he is. Oh, I, thanks. Great talk, Dan. I, I just congratulate you on your approach and your servant leadership for such a long time. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's so much that you're doing that's relevant to our context here. And I just want to give a shout out to Don Northfelt and everything he's done uh, to uh, work so closely and Dr. Patel as well um, in, in improving our relationship with Phoenix Indian Medical Center and our oncology referral practice there. And, um, I, and uh, Justin Anderson, one of our radiation oncology uh, residents, who's been working closely with Dr. Patel and I've been advising him on doing a little pilot study to try to understand referral care for radiation oncology. So it's very much in line with the spirit of what you've, you've uh, provided such a great model for. So um, I'm excited to keep collaborating and we've got a lot of cool things going with men's health. So we have one of our navigators that goes down to Phoenix for the winter. Imagine that they don't want to stay in rapid city. So he's going to be working with John down there, but that's what, I mean, John's been terrific. Like so many people that Mayo with Judith Cow. I mean, they're just a host of you folks that have been, and then that's the other message too for sustainability. You got to got to reach out to people because I mean we're we're not a major academic center by any stretch of the imagination, but fortunately we've been able to shoe, shoestring things together to to make it work. So, but no, we've always been very appreciative to the Mayo folks, and uh, as you know, we we're officially have some type of, of affiliation with Mayo. So, patients love you guys. You know that. So, it's an amazing your story is an amazing one. Really, one that to me has always been one of the amazing stories in radiation ecology. This is probably the first time I've actually had a chance to listen to part of it. And I can't wait to, I can't wait till we can host you uh, on site. Uh, so until that happens, uh, it's, well, uh, we're looking forward to it. Well, thanks again for the invite. And you're right. My nurse is texting me and looking at me. Like, yeah. I'm getting here. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. My nine o'clock Sim is here. So I better yes. get going. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank well, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thanks for listening.